you're good. Okay. You're set. Okay. Uh, yeah. so. So I know it's probably been a long day. You guys have been going around the clock. And so I appreciate what everyone's doing for the conference. It's exciting to hear all the uh, presentations. And this particular study is a study of COVID-19 and OER. I'll talk a little bit about its origins, but I was told one thing is I should uh, introduce myself. So who is Kathy? Um, I live in California. I have a family with two grown sons. Those of you with young children in the COVID period, teaching at home and juggling everything, just, you know, and people who are being teachers are on the ground, just kudos all around. It's a hard, hard period. Uh, we have a dog, Oreo, who I love to hike with. So I spend time with him and percolate on all things open and also along uh, my beach walks. Those of you who know me know I love the beach. And my history in OPEN um, comes from my early days at uh, the Hewlett Foundation, where I was the program officer who launched the original field of open education resources. So exciting to see how it's all grown. I became CEO of Creative Commons. I am now on the board of Open Ed Global. So I'm delighted to be in that position and to particip participate. And I have a uh, I've started my own consulting firm and executive coaching firm, and I do that do kind of a shared portfolio on that where I work with organizations and philanthropy around open, but other innovations as well. So that's who I am. So this question um, actually started with a conversation with the Hewlett Foundation with Kent McGuire. And here we have this period of nat natural forced experimentation with COVID. What can we learn from this period of change? And what can we learn about OER and where teachers are gravitating towards and where students at home are gravitating? Can they send some signals to us so we can help understand a little bit better about the future and then shift our uh, strategy perhaps to meet that future? So my role here was to really think about that and to see where people were gravitating towards, what was, what was the quick accelerance? And I start with this slide because I know, you know, we know the change, the pace of change in education is slow, either higher ed or K-12. It's just, you know, that's just human. All of us have a hard time changing. We have a forced accelerant, which is the, the virus, but then we also are forced to technology. And we've all seen that lots of conversations happening here, but that forces an exponential change. And so what we've seen now in this past about eight month period is you know, a five to seven year shift in the rapid adapt adaptation to technology, just much more faster than we ever expected. But one of the things I really wanna call out, and I know this has been called out in the open education space, but we need to call it out to the world is that emergency remote education. And I don't know if you can see on the left-hand side, let me shift over a little bit. It is not the same as distance education or online learning. So, you know, when people are saying now distance education doesn't work or online learning doesn't work, it's not true. What's, what's really difficult is this emergency remote education. And so I think we have to continue to call that out for people. And this particular um, journal article that came out um, early, a lot of OER researchers contribute to it across the the world, there are over 31 countries who were involved, really called this out. And I think this is really important. The other thing I just like to say about this is, um, you know, the Open University, who I learned so much from in the early days of open education. Um, and I know Asha was calling out what the open universities around the world have been doing. Um, you know, they've been studying distance education, and online learning, just like we've all been studying OER and open pedagogy, and we're not there. So it takes time, it takes time to do it well, and we have to continue to remind people about that. Okay, let's see. Um, now, kind of in this whole period of, you know, the virus happening, then we had the, the protests, the just come to the surface, completely needed in society, particularly here in the United States, but we saw the support all around the world and we know these issues exist everywhere. And these issues of Black Lives Matter, about social justice, about inequity, about systemic structural racism. And so I think we've got the, the uh, intersection of these two points, which are really powerful with openness. And so this is an opportunity that I think we could obviously not have um, imagined. 
Having said that, there's huge divides, right? When we talk about technology, you know, never will be the panacea. We have broadband divides, we have device divides, we have access divides, we have culturally relevant content divides, we have materials and home language divides, and we have walled garden divides. And OER can't solve all of that, but it can address a lot of it. And this picture on the left is quite striking. It's a uh, two young children, outside of Taco Bell here in California, supposedly one of the wealthier states in the nation, in the United States, and they don't have access to Wi-Fi. And this is true across California, and this is true across the United States and throughout the world in much deeper and systemic ways. So here you, you OER is uniquely positioned, and I say in principle, but not yet in practice, to overcome these divides, right? We're not there, we are accessible. We need a lot more BIPOC developed relevant content. We need materials and home language, not only translated, but culturally relevant. We just haven't invested in this. We've kind of getting, been getting the field off the ground. And this is our next segment that we really need to continue to push on. And OER doesn't have paywalls. You know, open is not partially open or restricted open that I sometimes call it. It really is when there is no paywalls and everyone can access. So uh, my question here is what have we learned? And I wanted to actually throw this out so we get a little bit of a conversation going. We're at the end of the day. You know, what have you learned about OER in this moment of time? And I wonder if we can just put a few comments in the chat, just you know, drop a sentence in about what you've learned uh, about OER in this moment in time. You think that is particularly unique. And I don't know if I can see the chat right now. So maybe someone can help me see what you're seeing in the chat. If you back out of your presentation, you should be able to see it. Okay. And we'll help monitor as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so right now you guys can just chime in, chime in. I'm, I don't worry about that. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so Amanda. Amanda Coolidge is telling us that she is saying yes, 100% in support, <laughs> as well as Christina, and one more. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And what I would say that I, what I have learned, uh, honestly, I think that a lot of people are um, seeing hope through OER. It's like there's mm -hmm. a sense of hope uh, that say, oh, well, we can find a way out. But again, going back to what you were saying, uh, people trying to find the, every answer there. Well, it's not exactly possible, but we can address many of of the issues. That's right. Um, but I was seeing maybe Una, you were sharing, I we can briefly see you. Or if anybody else wants to unmute themselves, please go ahead. We're not that big a group. Mm -hmm. And Stephen is saying, uh, convincing colleagues to make the change. Commitment yeah. in challenge is challenging, but this might be the moment. Right. Right. Alexandra also sharing OER access to knowledge for all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, well, let's just um, keep going and um, see how far we get here. So thank you. And, you know, I'm interested in Marcel. I'd love to have a conversation like, where are they seeing hope and why is the hope here now? And right, these are all the conversations. Where was it before? Yeah. <laughs> yeah what was it before? And Stephen, you know, just this, the, the, the challenge of human change, right? How hard it is to pick up new practices. We all know that. So these are some of the... Um, the leadership lessons I learned. And I think these are leadership lessons for higher education, for K-12 uh, institutions, and also for nonprofits who are working in the OER space or for-profits working in the OER space. So what we've learned about those organizations that have actually accelerated during this period or not only survived, but thrived, is that they really anchored on their values and they continue to clearly share out their value proposition. And they were always there, but now people began to understand them in a much different way during the time of this pandemic. Um, they, so they put them out there, they put out their clear value proposition. They're building ahead of the curve, right? And so this is one of the challenges for open ed. We've always been building ahead of the curve and it takes a while for people to catch up, but we need to continue to because when the moment in time happens is an opportunity for that transition. One, one part of organizations that have survived and open ed global is a great example, like it's a low level infrastructure, right? Everyone works from home, they're distributed around the world, it's truly global. Um, 
campuses who that are traditional do have that heavy burden of infrastructure, which is very expensive and it's going to be very difficult during this time of transition and budget cuts that we're going to see across the world with respect to education. And so how do we think about maybe a lower level of infrastructure because I do believe we all still need to meet I hope we all get to meet at the conference again soon but you know we need a lower level. And we have to optimize scenario planning. I think this has taught us more than anything else. The world changes quickly and we have to follow it pretty quickly as well. So I just wanna call out two models that I thought were really interesting as I look through kind of these case studies of what I found. So Minerva is a kind of an alternative high, higher education model, still quite small here in the United States, but essentially it's a four year program where students travel around the world and learn a set of skills and competencies tied to higher education. They'll have a semester in Brazil, one in Japan, somewhere in Europe. Uh, they become global citizens. It's a very low level of infrastructure for the organization because they just rent out space for the students. They have a uniquely built tool that they use for their content and learning that is technology-based that they've developed on their own. It's not necessarily open. So this isn't an open model, but I think this is part of the future that we're seeing, we, we, we will see. And the um, so the students can learn anywhere. So even though the students now have had to rapidly move home, in most cases, some could stay if they chose in whatever country they were at that time, the learning didn't change. It was really just the cultural aspect. And the cultural aspect is so important. And I see Christina nodding because we all know she was going to travel around the world, except everything happened. You know, it's so much, particularly for, you know, a young adult, particularly that age, what an opportunity. And also very low cost because they don't have a lot of infrastructure, some cost. What's interesting about this is they've now quickly brokered a partnership with Paul Quinn College, a historically black college here in the United States. The president said, you know, we've got to figure out a solution. My kids can't get to campus. We don't have great technology. Uh, what are we going to do? This is going to last for even longer. And quickly, very quickly, they put together this project and they have this urban um, scholars program that's launching this fall. And I think it's a great example. The Paul Quinn students will not be traveling around the world. They'll be doing projects in their local community. They don't actually have to be in the community a lot. They'll have to be in some, and I'm sure they'll do it in a safe way, but they're actually working on real life problems in their community. And so I think these are beginning to be some examples of what we can imagine for the future. In school age learning models, there's two particular programs that just call out when you kind of think about a systemic level who, who have just, uh, you know, the numbers have taken off. So the first one up top is called Common Lit. Common Lit typically has about 35 teachers sign up. I don't know if it's a day or a week. During the March of 2020, they had 35,000 teachers signing up per day. Right, and what, and what I like about this, this is a reading program and it has a, try, gets a lot of public domain content. It also gets uh, authors permission to use really relevant um, and exciting materials. It has a platform where the kids can engage so they can comment, people can comment on the comments. You know, it has that interactivity. So it isn't just a static uh, learning tool or on the phone or whatever it might be. And I think this is part of the future, particularly in school age learning because this model follows the student, whether they're in school or out. And for this next year or 12 months or six months, whatever it might be, we don't know where people are going to be. But we also know for the future, we're going to have new ways of learning. The other one on the bottom um, is Zern, Z-E-A-R-N. And they have really taken off as well. Their focus on teaching programs created by teachers. This is around math literacy. They push code every Thursday. So these again are not static. They're doing A-B testing every week. They're understanding how students are learning the materials, what content could work better for me vis-a-vis -vis Marcella or Steven, who has prior knowledge, how can we help the kids catch up. And what they do is they have some of the content is open, not all of it yet. So again, they're beginning to create an open model. But what I like about this is this is also something that can be in school, it can be at home, and they create a dashboard for districts. They try to work particularly with some struggling districts, um, and they are learning a lot about what's working for them. Districts don't always have real-time information, and this gives them real-time information. So for the teachers, this can be really, really valuable. Um, 
I think one of the big pieces that we've learned is that home is now normalized as a place of work and learning. This is this is the big change. And if we think we're all going to go back to kind of life as usual, I, I think we'd be we'll be surprised. I mean, our lives have changed dramatically. We're not out of this, at least through 2021, 2022, by the time we're all vaccinated and you know, business travel, everything will change. Uh, this particular author just released this book in October. He's um, an epidem epidemiologist. He's also like a, a sociology. It's called Apollo's Arrow. And it's really great about the profound and enduring impact on the way we live. And I think we have to be ready for this in education. And we have to be ready in thinking about this with respect to opportunities for open education. So what will learning experiences look like moving forward? There will be multiple pathways. Again, we're not there yet, and we've been talking about this for some time, but I think we're beginning to see more and more of this. We see students in higher education, 17%, you know, not enrolling like we expected this fall. They're, they're trying new routes, they're trying new things. They're gonna try, uh, there's gonna be a lot of flexible and permeable um, boundaries. So I think the institutions, and I'm not saying about the school aid, but more of the higher education, have to be a little bit more permeable and we're beginning to see some of the institutions try this more and more. Learning happens from cradle to grave. We knew this was gonna be needed in any case. We don't necessarily need four years all at a time, although it's kind of nice if you can be one of the few pri privileged re residential students or have that full-time experience that we're not trying to put everything together, uh, but that's only a very small percent of the population. So how do we think about the ongoing skills we need and when we will need them? And here, not only higher education is involved, but also industry is participating as well. We're gonna have alternative credentials. There's a lot of badging and other work going on and also creating that badge that carries with you throughout your lifetime. And it should be much more equitable access. So I see where we are on time. I just want to call this out. This is a great slide. It's been created about a year or two ago. Like this is exactly what we've been talking about. So we're, we're moving in that direction, right? Pe pedagogical practices, a participatory, the network, this peer learning, this knowledge creation, this empowerment. Uh, you know, students will be in physical spaces. They'll be in online spaces and they'll be in open online spaces. And we can begin to see more and more and we should begin to shift more into that as well. So here I see we have a few minutes left. Um, what I'd like to say is what do you anticipate in the future for teaching and learning and OER and um, you know what do you see that given your vantage point we're all sitting in different parts of this ecosystem what do you see as the kind of like the big the big change that you anticipate going forward and you can add it to the chat or just feel free I guess to unmute and chime in exactly Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. And, and yes, I would encourage everyone to just please unmute if you want to make a comment. It's easier than the chat. And, and yes, we are going a little bit on time, but nobody else is using the room. So if everyone's okay, we can go over a few minutes. Can you see the chat now, Kathy? I can. Uh, yeah. Or, I can oh, okay. Well, they, there were a couple of questions there. Um, I'll read them while people mm -hmm. uh, think. Okay. I see, I see. About an answer. Okay, so. How to scale it up, students traveling exactly. around the world. Mm -hmm. that, that's true. I, so, so what was interesting to me about that example is like, yeah, wouldn't that be sweet? Everyone gets to travel to like all these different cities and have this uh, great learning platform and small cohorts in different cities. No, not everyone's going to. But what's interesting to me is the Paul Quinn model is less expensive and home base. So they're experimenting now on how not to have to travel out of your community, but to make meaningful learning experiences. So I think what they're beginning to do is morph on their home model while beginning to focus more on the equity issues overall. Exactly. And just as you were saying, just the fact that these opportunities are arising, it's, it's just magnificent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, sorry, Kathy, I have a question. I'm just wondering, uh, from what you see, um, how do you, you know, like, the, this is what's so fascinating about the pandemic for myself, when I think about it, is the word global, mm -hmm. and this idea of connected, mm -hmm. and how, how that will shift what we think about um, this shared experience at a global level. 
And can you give any comment about what you think that means for OER? Yeah, so I think we've, I've always thought about OER and we had our, in the origins to think about OER as a complex adaptive system where you have all these local nodes, but the nodes are connected. And I think we're, we see that in a lot of projects. We see that with Creative Commons. We see that with Open Ed Global, right? They have regional capacity at the beginning to develop, but yet they, the regions, the countries get connected in a region, the regions connect to a, a, a larger hub. And I think when we think of global, yes, there's opportunities for us to just direct with other people across the globe but i think a lot of the connectivity will happen more in your local community and then your local communities co connecting to other communities in ways that we've begun to experiment with but i think they're still relatively small so um i think that when you think about the network and the peer learning uh, given if you have the technology, given you have the capacity to connect, you'll see it in these kind of um, stepped ways. Um, and it, periodically you see these great examples that are always called out in music or something else, um, where kids are finding each other across the globe and developing some really interesting programs. But global is a little bit of a, you know, it's like innovative. It's like one of those words, right? Like it's, what does it really mean? And what does it really mean in practice? Yeah, and who's included really in global. That's right, that's right. And another comment that Tanis was making that I find interesting is, uh, Tanis, I don't know if you want to address it, I'll just read it. Uh, OER at this time has surfaced a digital divide for her, which I think it's also true. Yeah, so I, yeah, the digital divide is so true. Um, and until that problem is solved, we won't be able to, equalize access. Interestingly, at the beginning of the field of OER, we actually made a concerted decision not to focus on like bandwidth and devices because ULIT as an organization at that time could only do so much. And we have to rely on governments and other institutions um, to address that. I would say that California being an example, I spent some time participating in now a series of conversation with funders focusing just on this digital divide issue. What happens is a lot of organizations don't focus on it as a primary um, strategy, it's more of a secondary strategy. And so the primary strategy doesn't get addressed. That said, you know, foundations can't build the infrastructure and the bandwidth for fiber and 5G. Uh, there is money in the US coming out of Congress, but it's very rural situated. And there's been lots of calls about how this is really equitable because uh, a lot of low income people of color live in the cities and the money is going out to rural. So then you're getting this tension and divide among uh, those who need the limited resources. So this is absolutely a core infrastructure problem that 20 years later, we're having the same conversation. There's, there's still people who are not fully connected. We have more solutions, but we're not there yet. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if we want to address one more question. I know that uh, several of you were all a little bit over, like five minutes, but if we can. Um, Alexandra, you were saying school scientists working together in Brazil and Europe. And also, oh, but these are comments. You, you can read the comments later. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so does anybody else have a question for Kathy? It's been a long day, Kathy. Yes. <laughs> Everyone's been up around the clock, I know. Yeah, but this is amazing. I think it's a wonderful way of closing the day um, with trying to tie everything in, in the situation that we are all living. And it's interesting how the perception of everybody of, of this community that is global, going again with the global word mm -hmm. of how each of us have a different perception depending on the location that we're in. That's so right. thank you very much for addressing this. And um, I will share actually to the entire group because I know that many, uh, several questions can pop up later. Mm -hmm. So I'll share the link to the OEG Connect area that right. will have this presentation. And if any questions uh, pop up later, they can contact you there. Perfect, perfect. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much for Thanks this wonderful everyone. presentation. Thank Thanks you, take time. care everyone. Bye-bye now.